there's something out there waiting for us. And it ain't no man. Don't you even know how to be a real Indian? Well, sometimes they have to kill us. They have to kill us. Because they can't break our spirit. Hey there everybody, it's Ian, back again for another episode of Native Film Talk. So what everyone think of the new intro? Pretty cool, huh? Something different. I, I, I wanted to do something different because we're at episode, almost episode 30, and I'm like, man, I've been using the same freaking episode, or same intro for every single episode. Let me mix it up. So I, I had some quotes from movies that were like, yeah, that'd be cool to use in, in, a, in an intro, and so I chose a few and got it done. So, hope everyone enjoyed it. Hope it's different. I mean, it is different, but I hope everyone likes to change. Um, if not, after a few episodes, you won't even notice it, I'm sure. Um, if there's a major, you know, request to change, I'll take that under consideration. But I'm happy with the new intro. I hope you all are too. Uh, so, it's good to be back. I, I, I think after finishing school, I think my body just collapsed at the finish because I got sick. I got really sick. It wasn't COVID, but I was pretty sick for a while. And it was like my me and my family were passing colds between each other. And I finally feel good. And I just wanted to get on here and get Longmire uh, Season 1 recorded. And, you know, I, this is the first TV show that I'm doing out of all the stuff that I've done up to this point. This is the first TV show. I've done moments in history. I've done really like scenes in a movie. But I haven't done a TV show yet. So the, this was an experiment. I think... Moving forward, I'm going to do less research and more reaction because I want to do Rutherford Falls. I want to do uh, Fargo Season 2 uh, when Reservation Dog comes out on FX. I want to be able to do that as well. Um, Resident Alien on Sci-Fi, I want to be able to do that as well. But just the amount of time I spend researching and digging into stuff, like I, I think I need to pare that down and really just stick with uh, you know my first thoughts and just kind of get on here and record. So that's kind of my thought process for the TV show. I did do a good amount of research for this one. So um, I really think that I know a little too much about Longmire <laughs> at this point. But it's good. I, You know, I, I watched Longmire. I was expecting to hate it. And I frankly went in wanting to hate it. Because at first glance, I saw the Western trope, the John Wayne kind of just idea of a Western where you have, it's like, let me guess, the old white guy is the badass of all badasses. Even though he claims that he's over the hill, he's going to come in and be bigger, faster, stronger, a better shot than everybody. He's a hopeless romantic. Watch him have this like, aw shucks personality. He has no idea how badass he is. And he's super humble. And he's one of those like all American guys that like looks out for all women, looks out for all women and children. And you know, he'll, 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 he'll kick the ass of every badass around and that's exactly what he is and he's like the smartest guy in every episode and it's annoying at first like the idea of that is annoying but the way it's executed it's not that bad like it's actually a good show when I watched the pilot after the first show I'm just like holy shit this is really good how was that the first episode um, I think I think so this is basically CSI Wyoming. You can basically call it that. It's it's I, I like that every every episode is different. Every episode is its own story in itself while keeping still um, some kind of like uh, through like it's still serialized in a way, um, even though every story you, you can pick up any episode and just watch it from there and still carry you can you, you don't have to watch. Uh, really from season uh, season one episode one to get everything and I kind of like that and the the character so I'll do a little bit of backstory about Longmire what how it came about because I'm not gonna lie initial reaction it's fucking good and the native representation in this is is solid when I was watching it I was waiting for it to be bad and there are some points that I could nitpick at and there are some areas that I think the writing really leans into like that, like the natives, like they really want you to know the natives in this TV show don't like white people. And the county that this place takes in, takes place in, in Wyoming, this, uh, Absaroka County, it's a fake county. It doesn't exist, but they chose to position it right next to a real, the real Cheyenne reservation. And so I don't know how I felt about that at first. And 
Come to find out, Craig Johnson has a guy, Marcus Red Thunder, that, you know, as a, a friend of his that's native, that grew up on the Cheyenne Res. He actually is from Wyoming, um, from a res near, yeah, near, near U cross where he grew up, where, uh, I'm sorry, where Craig met Marcus. And so they have a friendship and it shows, it makes sense. I can, he had some real deep knowledge in some of the areas and I'm just like, how does a random white guy know all this shit? Like, and, but, but it shows in the writing and Marcus Red Thunder is, is a technical advisor throughout the entire show. I saw some great interviews with him. And also people from the community that are just like, hey, he's doing good work. He's really advocating for the truth. And you can see it in the TV show, in the in the issues that are addressed. And you can see it also just that natives are present in every single episode. And it's not just a, hey, I'm a native person. Like, it's a native issue. Like, they're talking about MMIW. They're talking about ICWA, Indian Child Welfare Act controversies. They're talking about blood quantum issues. They're talking about casino rights and casino issues and all the controversy that goes around that. Even delving into the tribal politics a little bit. I think they play around. I think they really dance around, like, the jurisdiction issues. And I think they exaggerate that a little bit between, like, the state, the camp, between, like, the state, the county, and the fed. Um, really, jurisdiction laws. Um, I really don't think that they played that as well. And I think they really, I don't know, that, that I could have done a little w without. But, Jesus, this is this is a pretty damn good show. I'll tell you that. I mean, it jumps out right, right. It jumps out the very first episode with uh, you know an MMIW issue when they have that RV out in the woods and that was used as a prostitution ring, and Irene Bedard's daughter got abducted basically. And yeah, I mean, from the get go, you're like native issue. Here you go. And that's that, that then those are like real things that happen because a lot of that stuff is just, you know, not a cold case file. I don't know if that's the right word, but after a certain point, because it's like a jurisdiction thing of like, well, you know, we're from this county. We can't really help out. Uh, we'll call the FBI and the FBI is like, well, out of all the things we have going on, you know, I don't know. It doesn't really feel like a like a good thread to pull on, like it's going to yield any fruit. So. A lot of that really happens. A lot of that invisible statistic stuff. And so I really appreciate that sh the show for that. Talking about ICWA. Talking about abducted children. And social services. And these kind of like child um, foster care programs. Using the opportunity to exploit native children. Because they are a part of a protected you know, class in, in, in the wealth, in the foster care, in the foster care system. And so I don't, I didn't actually look into that if you would get more grant money to have Indian children, but because the, I know having gone through some foster care parenting classes before that there are higher rates of native american kids that do not get fostered with native people. And so when you are in the foster care program as a native person, um, as a foster home as a foster parent or yeah as a as, as a foster parent you get and you, you want to have native children like there's they're, they're they're out there pretty much and most times they go to non-native people and so i think that this this show really tried to touch on that and really get a bit help help us get a better understanding of what that's like i say us meaning like just everyday america of like this is what reality is for these people yeah Absaroka County is fake, but the issues that we're talking about in this are real. The alcoholism, the drug addiction, the casino issues, the blood quantum issues. The blood quantum issues was one of the most the substance, substantive things I've ever seen on television. And it's a shame that it had to take a white author, Craig Johnson, to finally get a platform, not maybe not finally, but to get a platform and to him for him to decide to talk about it. Because he's telling this story on our behalf and I mean, he's getting it right to a degree, but I didn't like how it was played out. But anyway, so I kind of really did a quick, quick glance over it, but let's, let's talk about the cast. So really there are five characters that are mainstays throughout the entire show. There's Robert Taylor, who plays, who's playing Sher Sheriff Longmire, Walt Longmire. And he's interesting. He's like a, a poor man's Harrison Ford. Like he looks like a mixture of Harrison Ford Will Patton, who plays Chick in uh, Armageddon, and Ed Harris. Like, he's a mixture of those guys. And 
he just looked like so many people throughout this show, but he's a hell of an actor. He's an Australian actor, actually. This is like his big break. He's never really had like prominent acting roles. And I think that Craig Johnson had a, had a, he had a big hand in casting the show when the showrunners decided to, you know, launch this thing. They were like, all right, you, you have a Walt Longmire in your head. What does he look like? So they started sending him audition tapes and he eventually came across Robert Taylor and was like, that's Walt Longmire. Australia or not, that's the guy. So he's a mainstay. He's in all 63 episodes. This show ran through season six and that's, I, as far as I know now, it's officially canceled. It, it's its second time being canceled. I'll talk a little bit about that later if people are interested. Uh, but Vic Moretti, she is also a mainstay all throughout the entire series. Cassidy Freeman, who is Katie, who is Walt's daughter, and the Ferg is also a mainstay throughout the show. And then also the controversial, slightly controversial, Lou Diamond Phillips as Walt Meyer's best friend, Walt Longmire's best friend, Henry standing bear he is the cheyenne bartender slash owner of the bar and it's interesting <laughs> i don't know how i feel about it um i fluctuated throughout the entire season with him in that role because lou diamond phillips is a draw when looking at this you're you can see who this is catered to this is a, this show was launched on a and e the viewership the demographics of the viewers rather skewed toward 40 and over and those people know Lou Diamond Phillips like he's there stand and deliver uh, La Bamba people know him from older movies and so he was a draw he was a reason why people wanted to come see this and it was evident in a lot of comments and uh, that I saw on YouTube there were people that said, you know, I would just Google scenes from Longmire, like the prominent ones, and I would just watch a few just to just to get a feel for the comments. And a lot of people would say, like, I watched this because of Lou Diamond Phillips. He was the reason why. And when you look at the cast, out of everybody, Robert Taylor, Katie Stack, Sackoff, Lou Diamond Phillips, Cassidy Freeman, Adam Bartley, he's the one that pops out. Out of everybody in this, he's probably the most famous person in this, like, lineup. Luann Stevens is Ruby. She's the kind of uh, administrative assistant to the sheriff. And I know her as, uh, you know, from Friday Night Lights. Uh, that That's that's how I know her. You know, Saracen's mom? No, Saracen's grandma? That's how I know her. She's like probably the only other person I really knew outside of this, outside of the natives, of course. Um, so I thought this cast was really kind of a hodgepodge. And so I wasn't expecting a lot of native representation, but in every single episode, there's native representation. And it's like not just here or there. Like I mentioned, they touch on some real serious stuff. So let's go over some natives that appear throughout the show, not just in this season. But in this season, there's a lot of Zon McLarnon. And that's pretty awesome in itself. Zon McLarnon's a great actor. He eventually had to leave the show, as I read later on, for Fargo Season 2 for his role in, as Hans E. Dent. He left to go film for that, and that was not a bad move at all. <laughs> I mean, this show kept going. He would have made money either way, but uh, Hans E. Dent is a fucking force. And I don't know this guy's name. It just says A. Martinez, but the person who plays Jacob Nighthorse, he's a native dude. Um... He did a great job as Jacob Nighthorse. The Dog Soldier episode, holy shit. I'm going to talk about that. But Jacob Nighthorse, he was great. And later on in the show, Graham Greene has a recurring role. Um, we saw Irene Bedard in the very first episode of this, and she makes a appearance a couple episodes, uh, like well, I think one episode later on in the show. And there's some there's some prominent native actors in this. David Mid Thunder makes a few episodes, I think five, you know, six episodes um, throughout the entire series, and he has a recurring role. Tantua Cardinal eventually has a recurring role as a crow medicine woman, and Julia Jones eventually makes a few appearances. I was pretty surprised at the native. It's really like almost like the more most prominent native people you can think of. They're in this. And it's interesting to me that out of all of those people, you chose Lou Diamond Phillips to be your lead on this show. And I don't, I don't know about it. <laughs> 
but let's uh let's talk about this 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 show so craig johnson he's 60 years old when he started watching tv or really getting into tv i guess and seeing what was on he saw a lot of csi the csi boom kind of like in the early 2000s and he was like you know what i can do this I can write, you know, where's where's rural America in this? Because he's from rural Wyoming. He lives in Ucross, Wyoming, which is a town of a couple hundred people right next to the, uh, I think he said, just south of the Cheyenne, one of the Cheyenne reses, Cheyenne and Crow res. And he's like, there's, there's no representation of rural America in the CSI shows. They're all in urban community. They're all in, you know, urban settings. And they all have access to DNA and forensic scientists. Like in urban in urban America, we don't have any of that. And he got confirmation from his county sheriff. He went into his office and was like, asked the sheriff, like, hey, is this true? You know, I'm, I'm thinking of writing a book uh, basing a character kind of not off of you, but just off of a sheriff. And here's a few of my ideas. And one of the things I want to talk about is how ridiculous that idea that you can just get DNA and solve a murder like that and he's like yeah here out here rule america good luck we'll get results in a couple of months if if we even have dna pulled from the scene and one of the cool things was the person that he met <clears throat> the sheriff had books on his shelf so that was kind of his inspiration he wanted walt longmire to be kind of a sherlock holmes uh really kind of savant a very just well-read person and so that comes across in the show. He knows a little bit about everything, whether it's, uh, you know, horses or I don't know, just general everything. He knows a lot about everything. Walt is a badass throughout this show. But Craig, he wrote, he made a living out of this. He wrote 21 of these freaking books, 21 Sheriff Longmire books. And this guy's a millionaire now, basically, because multimillionaire because of this show. And it's uh yeah it's it's pretty good i i didn't read any of books and I, I really don't plan on doing it i'll continue watching the show but something that i found interesting was the native representation i'm just like this guy had to know somebody he had to know somebody and he did his name is marcus red thunder he is an individual that met him while he was an adult i don't believe they knew each other growing up as kids but marcus is actually Ojibwe and Cree, but was adopted <clears throat> in America, in Wyoming. And so he grew up on the Cheyenne Res, and so he actually more identifies with the Cheyenne culture because that's kind of where he was raised and raised in the Cheyenne community. So he's been a technical advisor throughout the show, and that's why that shit works. I think they listen to him, and I think they really respect him, Based on the interviews I've heard of him and people's response in the community, Marcus Red Thunder gets it right and people listen to him. Even though there's no native writers that I could see. If there's a native writer later on in the show, I apologize, but in season one, I didn't see any. If there's a native director, I didn't see one. Native producer, I didn't see one. How the, how the hell did this white dude, this white author get it right? Because he touches on some heavy shit. He touches on Iqua. He touches on casino issues. He touches on blood quantum. He touches on MMIW all in season one. And I'm just getting started. I have a feeling it gets deeper as it goes on. He even touches on witchcraft. And he got it more right than I would say Tony Hillerman. Who is his inspiration? Tony Hillerman, like skinwalker stuff. Like I'm Navajo. That's like me. And it's like Tony Hillerman listened to somebody and kind of just like got a little too squirrely about it at a certain point. He probably made like one good book that was okay, that was like close to accurate. Everything else was just like him running with wild imagination. But back to this show, I I still when I when I first started watching it, I was just like, this is this this show is gonna be chasing old westerns. It's gonna be chasing the glory of the old westerns. And it's really not like that, and it's and it's crazy. I want to focus on a few things in this show. So Marcus Red Thunder, hats off to him. Sounds like he did a great job being a person that pulled on Craig's ear. But also, the fun fact, Marcus Red Thunder 
the character that Lou Diamond Phillips plays, Henry Standing Bear, is based on Marcus Red Thunder. So it, with that being said, you know, uh, Craig Johnson fancies himself a little, a little bit of a Walt Longmire, a little long in the teeth, but also kind of a, I don't know, just a person from the, from a days, days, days of past and really just, you know, doesn't want to have a cell phone, wants to live off the grid, that kind of person. But let's talk about Marcus Red Thunder because episode five. And spoiler alert, I mean, this isn't really a spoiler alert. Please, if you've seen this, if not, just type in Dog Soldier Ending in YouTube and watch that clip. If you've seen this episode, holy fucking shit. At the very end, when we see Jacob Nighthorse, and it is Jacob Nighthorse when they end the episode to show this was the episode with the child of children being abducted and they were trying to figure out where these kids were going and at the beginning of this show you see i i I think it was rod rondeau if i remember correctly if i if i if i caught that correctly not remember but it looked like rod rondeau was getting beat up at the beginning of this episode who was a great stuntman and actor in miko but he loses a couple of teeth and those teeth are used at the end of the episode. And Jacob Nighthorse is dressed up as a dog soldier. Looking into the moonlight. Has these freaking molars, it looks like, in his palm. And he has this, like, leather strap. I'm getting goosebumps just thinking about this. He has these, like, leather strap around his hip. And he has this, like, wooden stake into the ground that the leather strap is, like, almost fastened to. And he is raising up those teeth in his palm like toward the moonlight and staring straight up. And he's in the whole dog soldier regalia garb. And that was too fucking real. (laughs) That was just too real. I don't know what school bus stories he heard. Like that was too real, man. Like, ugh. Season 1, Episode 5, Dog Soldier Ending. If you haven't seen it, go watch it. If you're native, I think the whole Pretendian thing, you, you that, that should be the DNA test. <laughs> if you watch that scene at the very end and you're freaked out, you're a native. <laughs> you're, you're for sure real native. Because that shit, oh, that was terrifying. It's just, and if you know, you know. I'm not even going to try to explain it. It's just, it was so scary. Me and my wife watched it, and my wife was just quiet. And I was just like, what the fuck was that? That was so scary. And my wife is just like, thank God you said something, because I just wasn't sure. And we tried to, like, laugh it off, and it was one of those, like, our, we went down, our head went down, like, so many Yana stories and so many Skinwalker stories and shit. We were just like, okay, we got to change the channel. Let's go watch some Disney. Let's go, let's go finish the night with something, like, playful so we don't have to have these thoughts bouncing around in our head. That was too real. That was one of the realest native witchcraft things I've ever seen in my life on TV or, or, or on a movie. That was wild. Um, that was pretty impressive. Um, but Jacob Nighthorse too. He's 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 a good role. The guy who plays him, um, A. Martinez. I need to remember his uh, first name. Adolfo. Adolfo Martinez. That's what it was. And he was in Powell Highway. So he's 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 been around for a while. Um, and so it was really good to see him <clears throat> in this in this role. And I really think that that dog soldier episode really made me realize like they're not doing this just for show like yeah they chose to do this but it's not like they sensationalized it and like tried to explain it what was going on and they just left it there they just ended the episode they never draw back to it call back to it in season one they never allude to what was going on but it's just like it really is like if you know you know and that's that's the best way i can explain it and i thought that was one of like the coolest things i'd ever seen in in a tv show with native representation and what was cool is every episode had a native whether it was lou diamond phillips or not you know i'll talk about that a little bit later um but it was it was pretty cool so i really think that i want to address something with the native representation while it was right for the most part i didn't like how 
the police had to like hate white people. The natives in the TV show, they really wanted it to be not just the police. Like they really wanted all shine. They really wanted to show like natives hate white people or all natives distrust white people. Hate's a strong word. All natives distrust white people. And yeah, to a degree, but they really only showed that face. Where it's like, if you're, what are you doing on this side of the line? Get back over there. Like, every interaction was like that. I was just like, hey, you're on our land. Get off our land. He's like, there's nothing here for you to take, white man. Get off my land. And they, they really leaned into that. That was one of the things I didn't like about this show. Is, while the, while the issues were real... The native characters outside of Lou Diamond Phillips didn't really have any dimension. Outside of Zon McLaren, because at the end of the show, or in the season one rather, he ends up, to help with a jurisdiction issue, he ends up moving a body from the res to the state line, over into the state, uh, so that way the county can handle the murder. Because he knew he would be conflict of interest. It would be an issue if he handled it. And that interaction with him was between him and Walt to explain all that was growth. Because up to that point he was like, what do you want white man? The hell are you doing over here on our property? And I really didn't like that part of it. Like they just showed us to be very militant. Like the worst part, maybe not the worst parts, but they really tried to like say like, oh, these are hardcore like aimsters. These people are militant. They will, you know, they'll beat up the first white person they see. I really didn't like that. Um, But outside of that, though, I will say Craig Johnson, I I always say I measure intent and the response of the audience. And overall, people enjoyed it. Like they didn't, they were educated by a lot of the issues uh, based on comments on YouTube and forums that I read. But Craig Johnson said something specifically about in an interview with uh regarding his Lou Diamond Phillips character and I'll I'll read what he said is my ranch is just south of the northern Cheyenne and Crow reservation so these are my friends my family they are my neighbors so it's important I try and get that kind of thing right and I don't think there's ever been a group of individuals that have been more maligned as not having a sense of humor as much as the American Indian they're always portrayed as the cigar, cigar store stoic how kind of characters. And so the question that was asked was like Henry Standing Bear played by Lou Diamond Phillips. He's funny. Walt Longmire, he's funny. And I think the interviewer was just trying to bait him into saying like, you know, the rest of America think urban America is not funny. That they're just... Out there taking their time, just doing this, you know, just they're, they're, she's just painting a stereotype, basically. And he responds with an opportunity to talk about the misrepresentation of Native people in cinema and television. And he was like, I know Native people. And he didn't say it in a way that's like, oh, yeah, my best, for, I, I, my, my best friend's black, therefore I can say the N-word. It wasn't one of those situations. It was like, and it wasn't one of the ones of like, hey, hey, hey I, I know a Cherokee person, you know, or my, 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 my co-worker's native and they're, they're not offended by the Redskins. It wasn't even that. And he's just like, these people are a part of my community and I know what these people are like day to day. And I've met native people and they're, just, I, and they're nothing like what I've seen on TV. So I wanted to use this as an opportunity to get it closer to right and... And it shows, and I, I, you know, I have a lot of respect for him for that. Now, let's get to Lou Diamond Phillips. There's a lot of native talent in the show, as I mentioned before: Sam McLarnon, Irene Bedard, Graham Greene, Tantu Cardinal, Julia Jones, and I'm sure there's others. Why Lou Diamond Phillips? I said I know why because he's a draw. When you look at the talent. The cast is relatively unknown. Robert Taylor, Australian unknown. Katie Sackhoff, I have known her maybe from one thing. She's, um, gosh, why can't I think of it off the top of my head? She is in Chronicles of Riddick, Battlestar, Battlestar Galactica. I don't know why that took me so long to come up with. She's in Battlestar Galactica. 
you know, Cassidy Freeman, you may or may not know her from other work, but, you know, she was in really like Smallville and that's, that's about it. The Ferg, I don't even know who the Ferg is prior to this show, Adam Barley. Lou Diamond Phillips was the draw as Henry Standing Bear that people knew. A&E viewers that love this show that dedicated the majority of the viewership, comprised the majority of the viewership, were 40 and over. So that means that they were stand and deliver, they were La Bamba fans. And that's what showed in the comments on YouTube. They were like, oh, I loved him in stand and deliver, I loved him in La Bamba. You know, and to me, he's the Filipino guy that plays one of the most prominent Hispanic singers in history <laughs> and he's also you know he plays one of the he plays richie valens in la bomba he plays you know a, the navajo officer in in dark wind and so to me i was just like i was preparing i was bracing myself to be disappointed and he's already faced backlash because he's claimed cherokee at one point in his lineage and he really like backstepped you know backtrack that and now he dances around it and he says and i quote i don't claim to be native but i do have native blood (laughs) so that's how he dances around it now that was in a cowboys and indians interview um cowboys and indians magazine interview that he did so that's how he gets around it now and with all that native talent that they hired hindsight being 2020 i don't know if they knew it would blow up as big as it did you know kudos to them to try to make it right by hiring more native talent but i was disappointed that lou diamond phillips is playing a native because people probably think he's native and the likelihood that he's going to get cast in the future to play another native is higher now because especially now six seasons as henry standing bear he's probably going to be looked at quicker for a native male role than you know maybe a Zon McLarnon or Graham Greene he'll get passed over for Lou Diamond Phillips potentially because he's ambiguously ethnically ambiguous and he's played the part before and he's a draw people would show up for Lou Diamond Phillips and I think that's bad representation because, yeah, he dances around it. Mr. I don't claim to be native, but I do have native blood. Like, nice. What a a great political freaking response. But I really think that by, by, by having that stance... But still taking roles as native char- as a native character, especially when you're a mainstay character like Henry Standing Bear, I think that's. Ugh. I think you're just. You know, I'm not going to go as far as saying you're taking food from people's mouths, but I think you definitely are altering the audience's perception of like what a native looks like. And yeah, you can say it's acting, and yeah, you don't have to be of that tribe to be an actor. To be acting from that native about acting on behalf of a person from that native nation but i would like to at least have you be native <laughs> to 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 do that that's that's my opinion um but lou devon phillips has made a career being the ethnically ambiguous person playing kind of those multiple nationalities in his career so i mean he's i shouldn't say that's like to be expected because i don't mean to say that in a negative way but I really think that because he's made a career doing that, people are willing to cast him in that manner. So I don't know, but let's talk about let's talk about a little bit of a little bit. Of, let's go negatives then positives this time because that really is my first negative is Lou Diamond Phillips. While he is not a pretendian, he's not someone that claims to be native anymore. Didn't stop him from playing a native. I get it. You're someone that's going to draw an audience, but. In 2013, when this show started, that's unacceptable to me, to me. That's some shit like that. This close enough idea is crazy. A&E could have done better. Like when they, when they got this show going to me, they could have done better, but whatever. I think overall though, and, and I think another negative is maybe they do it later on in the show, 
but they made that res be poor. And I think I think because I'm from the res, I understand and we have our problems and it looks poor from the outside, but it's not. And I feel like they didn't I don't know. They they, they just really had this like very clear difference between the res and the outside. And they really tried to make it seem like Look at these poor Indians, in a way. And it, had, it felt a lot like Wind River at times, where it's like they showed one side of the res. <clears throat> and like I said, season one, maybe it gets better. But they had like the Indian tracker in this. Lou Diamond Phillips for one episode was the Indian tracker. Oh, there's the, the one native that the white guy hangs out with. And even though he is the alpha of everything, he is not a better tracker than the Indian. So Indian, go track. Go be Billy and Predator. Go be the best tracker that everyone knows because you're Indian. I didn't like that. Like, but it worked. It worked in the show, you know. Um, he wasn't all-knowing. He did get educated by the Ferg because there was a there was a fossil kind of rock that Lou Diamond Phillips didn't recognize. He was like, yeah, this isn't from here, and it helped him crack the case. But I just didn't like that part. I didn't like that. Um, but that's not enough for me to not like the show. So let's go to the positives. The writer of the book, Craig, jo Craig Johnson, he just gets it. I don't know what it is necessarily that I'm talking about because it's, it's nuanced and it's complex, but there's just a lot of stuff that he got right. Like this show, when you watch it, I'm waiting to be disappointed. And if there's somebody that was disappointed when you watch this show, send me an email. Send me a DM on Instagram. Shoot me a message on Facebook. Like, tell me you hated this show or tell me what bothered you about it. Because I'm Navajo from the Southwest, not from Cheyenne Res. I'm not from Montana, Wyoming, Idaho, South Dakota, North Dakota area. That whole world is different. And I'm not Cheyenne, so I'm sure there's stuff that maybe Cheyenne people don't like about this show. And maybe there's stuff that I missed. I'm sure there's stuff I missed. They're like, oh, yeah, here's a awesome thing you didn't talk about. Uh, but overall, I liked it. And there's just, as a native person, he just got shit right. And I hate it because Lou Diamond Phillips is the lead native person in this. He's Henry Standing Bear, and I'm like, man, fuck Lou Diamond. But why is he in that role? But it's a good TV show. It's a good show. CSI Wyoming. Not bad at all. I'm going to watch season two. I'm going to start doing that. You know, I and I really think what Craig Johnson has to say is he wants to get it right. And while he wants to get it right, unfortunately, he's still a white guy living near a res. So he's only going to know so much. Yeah, he has Marcus Red Thunder that can come on as a technical advisor and lend some help. But a technical advisor is not a producer, is not a writer, is not a director. Blood Quantum lives in that world and then explores. Longmire lends a, gives a lens to the world that Native people live in. And that's the difference, is blood quantum, you're like in the fucking snow globe. <laughs> Whereas Longmire is showing you the outside of that, of like what that looks like. Like blood quantum, you're in the deep end of the water. And I, I, I really think that's the big difference. And there are shows, you know, I've, I've, I'm going to do Rutherford Falls eventually, but there's like Rutherford Falls humor that just goes over some people's heads or it gets a little chuckle. But because you're in the deep end and you're initiated and you know that world, you're rolling on the ground laughing and you're just like, holy fucking shit, I feel seen. And while Longmire is awesome, this is supposed to be the positives, Ian. While Longmire is awesome, I didn't, I just got a lot of like, oh, that's cool they're including this. I didn't have that same feeling I felt with Rutherford Falls. 
where I'm just like, holy shit, this is on TV? <laughs> Outside of Dog Soldier. Dog Soldier, something happened there. <laughs> Somebody freaking gudging the set or something. <laughs> Somebody got something too right. Like, that was too real for me. Um, Dog Soldier was too real. But there are things I'm like, oh, that's cool they included this. But it was cool in the sense that, like, when I watch Wind River... And I'm like, oh, MMIW, they actually are talking about it. MMIW, blood quantum issues, and um, ICWA, Indian Child Welfare Act. I'm like, oh, yeah, that's interesting they talked about those. So if you're looking for a show, Longmire's pretty damn good. I, don't, I can't say anything about the books, but I can say something for Craig Johnson. He seems like a white guy that's just trying to get it right. I feel like maybe he's Tony Hillerman in the sense that he's probably going to use his imagination a little too much and get stuff wrong. Uh, but maybe not. Who knows? I think if you're looking for a show that's, you know, that like, hey, overall, the represent like the representation isn't bad. You're not going to get the leather and feathers. You're not going to get the alcoholic stumbling into the, uh, you know, the bar just because he's native. Like, you're going to get probably the closest thing you can see to a border town interaction from the white person's lens. <laughs> a border town, like, interaction, uh, really, yeah, from, from the white person's lens. And it's it's relatively accurate, I think. I think it's relatively accurate, you know? I mean, you can nitpick all you want, but when it's all said and done, you have 63 episodes of this, and... The majority of the viewership is 40 and older, and I think that because they grew up on the older westerns, the John Wayne era, from what they were fed from the John Wayne, Clint Eastwood era of the westerns, they saw that transformation of the stoic Indian, the noble savage, to now where they're not only native people, they're not, they're not only people that live in America, but they're also people that face problems and struggles that you have no idea what are what what that's like but also you can stand to be educated a lot you can stand to be educated to learn a lot about how these people ended up where they are the struggles they face today and i think this show does that to a certain degree and a and e canceled this show after three seasons because of their viewership they were getting a lot of viewers like 3 million, I think 3 million, 3.5 3 million viewers for their fi season 3 finale. And they ended the show because their viewership was 40 and older. And they were like 18 to 36 is where our sponsors and ads want our people to be because all our commercials are geared toward that. So only like 4% of our audience is that. 96% is all AARP people. We can't, we can't make any money off of them off of these you know yeah off of these older individuals so they canceled the show even though it was wildly popular and then netflix picked it back up and they took it for another three seasons and when you listen to people talk about this show they talk about it of like this is revolutionary to them there are articles written by the aarp the retirement you know uh, association and cowboys and indians magazine just by the publications that longmire is uh, there's interviews and Q&As in. You can tell it's an older audience. But when you hear them talk about it, to them, they're like, holy shit, did you know about all these Indian issues? Oh my gosh, I had no idea there was blood quantum issues. I had no idea there was casino issues like that. Did you know there was, you know, federal jurisdiction and, uh, you know, tribal police and you know, county police, you know, there was all these jurisdiction issues with committing murders and crimes on the reservation. Holy crap, you know. You could potentially start diving into the Marshall Trilogy if you really wanted to, to learn about the formation of native law and Indian law, what that crap look what that crap looks like with crimes across the board. And I really think it it's helpful for the older generation. If you want to watch Longmire and you're in your mid thirties, you're you're in your twenties, you'll 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 probably be eh or not. You know, it may or may not be for you. I enjoyed it. 
because I really like CSI, and that's what this show is really like. It's like a crime-solving show, but I really think for the older generation, 50 and over, people that like die hard, that like stand for this movie, or TV show rather, I think it's beneficial for them. Because one, they're going to show up and actually watch it. This isn't like a woke thing, but it has a woke lens in the sense that they get a lot of shit right. So I don't want to make this episode too long. One, because my voice isn't as good as I thought it was. Um, kind of coughing a little bit more than I thought. But I appreciate everyone, all your support. Episode 29 is where we are. And I'm having a lot of fun with this now. Now that I'm done with school. Um, next, I'm going to be doing an episode on the Hollywood Diversity Report that's published by the study conducted by UCLA. And then I also have One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest that's going to be coming up. And then I will be also doing Rutherford Falls. And I have a couple of interviews with people that I have lined up in the next uh, next two weeks. And I can't say who they are yet, um, And but, but it's going to be cool. <laughs> Actually, so I'll say one, Riker Six Killer. If you have no idea who Riker Six Killer is, um, there's a podcast called the Oki Podcast. And that's a great podcast. He's like the native Joe Rogan. He's just like interviewing anybody and everybody that's like a native prominent person doing anything cool that he finds cool and they just have cool conversations and his and first episode of his show Oki podcast is Riker Six Killer so if you want to learn a little bit about him um go check that episode out but he's a fascinating individual and then I'm also going to interview Allie Young she is the founder of Protect the Sacred and she's also a Dartmouth alum which is how I know her but uh, I want to bring her on because she has a you know she has a good career in film and television, still continuing to be in film and television, trying to write, trying to produce shows, create shows, create content. And I really just want to get her on here to talk about some of the struggles she's had as a native woman, as a native woman in the film industry, as a woman in the film industry, as a native person in the film industry, uh, the challenges of representation. She has a very uh, great story. I, mean, I shouldn't say great story, but she has took a great stand at one point when she walked off the set of Adam Sandler's movie, um, and I think that was just a you know a, a mass walk off during the filming of that movie. So I will go ahead and just leave it at that. And if anyone's interested, you know that'll be out within the month. But I think those two will be great interviews, and we just got a lot of stuff cooking. Rutherford Falls is out. Go check that out. I've only seen the first three episodes. And highly recommend you go watch that. Another one, Resident Alien, Season 1. Go check it out. Season 2 did get uh, did get picked up, so that's exciting. I hope the same thing happens for Rutherford Falls. All right, everybody. Talk to you later. Mm-hmm.